Hi, my name is Greg Martin. I'm going to be talking about fragile states and health. I was invited to talk at the Global Health Forum 2014 at Charles University. Now, unfortunately, I can't physically be at the conference today, but we've made this video instead. And if you're watching this at the conference, at the end of this video, they're going to connect me with you over Skype and I'll be able to take some questions. So what is a fragile state? Well, generally it's agreed that a fragile state has a problem with legitimacy or capabilities and or capabilities in such a way that it leaves the citizens of that state vulnerable to shocks. And we're going to talk a little bit about what we mean by shocks in a second. A little metaphor, if I was holding in my hand a rubber ball and I hit it with a hammer, that the shape of that rubber ball and the integrity of that rubber ball wouldn't be that affected, it would be indented, but it would bounce back. If, however, I was holding a crystal vase and I hit that with a hammer, the crystal vase would shatter because it's fragile. So when talking about fragile states, we mean that small changes, so these shocks to the social, the political, the physical, the financial, the agricultural, or the epidemiological environment, has a disproportionately high impact on morbidity, mortality, disability, and the well-being within the population. Now, I'm talking about this from a health perspective. Obviously, there are all sorts of other ramifications as well, but because this talk is about health, we're going to focus in on that. Now, there are about 50 countries in the world today that we consider to be fragile states, and that constitutes about 25% of the world's population. A couple of facts about fragile states. About half of all children who die under the age of five are living in fragile states. A third of all the people living in fragile states today are malnourished. Malaria death rates are 13 times higher in fragile states than they are in other developing countries. About one and a half million people today live in conflict areas. 28.8 million people are internally displaced and 10.4 million people are currently living as refugees. Our starting position is we've got the state, we think it's a fragile state because there's problems with capabilities, capacity and legitimacy. There's some kind of shock that's imposed upon that, that state. It could be conflict, it could be famine, it could be a range of things and we'll talk about the list of possible shocks in a second. That the vulnerable populations or the entire population within that state are disproportionately affected in terms of the health outcomes, in terms of morbidity, mortality, disability and general well-being. We often see this happening in states that are in conflict. Non-violent causes of excess mortality in states that are in conflict often outstrip the violence-related causes of excess of civilian mortality in these countries. So, for example, there'll be damage to infrastructure. There may be a road that is usually used to take uh, medical supplies from point A to point B. The road is damaged or bombed, and suddenly point, people at point B land up dying. In Darfur, between 2003 and 2008, 87 percent of all of the civilian excess mortality was due to non-violent causes. And I'm telling you this to sort of illustrate this knock-on effect. You've, you've, you've got a fragile state, you have a shock, and then you have this knock-on effect that has implications for health. So let's talk about what these shocks can be. There's uh, social and political shocks. Obviously, there's violence and conflict, violence against women, human rights violations, etc., etc., which can translate into all sorts of other problems. There's physical shocks, right? We've got floods, storms, droughts, earthquakes, tsunamis, extreme weather conditions, uh, radiation exposure, crop failure, etc. There's financial shocks. There's financial and economic crises, food price shocks. We saw that in 2008, absolutely devastating. Epidemics. Now, interestingly, if we look at this, uh, this latest Ebola epidemic in West Africa, all four countries affected by the, Ebola, by the Ebola virus at the moment are all considered to be fragile states. So again, to reiterate our, the central theme of this talk, we've got, we've got this idea of a fragile state. We've got some kind of shock happening to the state. It could be any of the things that I've just listed. And that shock has implications that disproportionately affects people's health in that country. So let's take a look at some of these knock-on effects. Shocks can translate into decreased access to food, clean water, sanitation, health services, shelter, physical security, and many more things like it. Now, these things have an immediate effect on health, and I think those effects are quite obvious. There are some longer-term effects of the shock that also have effects on health. Things like decreased access to education, justice, uh, equity and human rights protections, political participation. All of these things, in the long run, can really impact health. And in fragile states, they, they affect health in a way that is disproportionately high. Now, in this conversation, we're clearly interested in health. But it's important to know that everything is interrelated. There's the, the social and political problems have health implications and changes in the health systems or changes in health outcomes have social and political implications too. We're going to talk mostly about, from a health perspective, what we can do to try and protect vulnerable populations from shocks. So if it's the case that we want civilians to be less vulnerable to shocks, the thing that we need to do is to strengthen health systems. And I want to talk about health systems for a minute. So when we talk about health systems, we're really talking about six building blocks, right? And I'll just go through them quickly. The first is human resources for health. 
The second is having medical products available. The third is having health services and facilities functioning. The fourth is information technology. The fifth is finance. And the sixth is governance and leadership. Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on healthcare systems, but suffice to say that by strengthening healthcare systems, you decrease the vulnerability of civilians to shocks as they may occur. Now, I suppose my closing remark is this. We need to remember when addressing healthcare issues and, and health improvements in the country, we're actually trying to break a cycle. Uh, that is, poor health actually contributes to state fragility, which of course then contributes to worsen, worsening health. And we want to break that cycle and actually reverse it. Improvements in health, less fragility leads to more improvements to health. Thanks for listening. I hope you found this useful. We're looking forward to your questions.